Okay. So how is the plant still go? Is there stuff still left over? There are a few things left over, but they're mostly, um, I mean, it's mostly really a lot of shade things, which is good because I'll probably mention it tonight um, oh, yeah. for Master Gardeners. And then, uh, but we don't have a lot left. So we have like a I thousand plants. And... Hmm? Okay, I won't do that. No, because there's a lot of non-master gardeners here. Okay, well, we'll just put it out in an email. Yeah. Um, and we don't have that many left. I would say we're under 200 for sure. And so we sold 800 and some. I just sold a few. My husband's going to watch the, I didn't, I forgot, not that I forgot I was going to do this, but I told people they could come and shop um, from four to eight today. And I'm busy. So my husband's going to watch it. I <laughs> watch the sale. Oops. <laughs> yeah. So hello, everybody that's coming in. Um, we'll be giving a few minutes for people to get comfortable. Um, if you've done other webinars like this, you are not going to be able to see yourself. So don't be alarmed. You'll see me and Kathy and Tom. And you can see in the chat, here's Julie. She says, thank you for this presentation. Yeah. We're, we're just remarking on the technology and how it's kind of changing things for this. And uh, I've been liking this format. Um, how we'll be doing this is we'll be doing the questions at the end. So if you have questions along the way, there, along the bottom, there's a Q&A box that you can put your questions in and um, we'll get them answered for you at the end. There's also a chat if you're having some trouble. Um, Technology, I can try to help you if you have some trouble. We're up to 44, so not yet seven. <coughs> I did my planting yesterday. <laughs> did you? Well, it's a good day to do it right before all these rains. Yeah, so. well, then all the rain, I'm like, you know, somebody showed me their flooded garden. I'm like, well, you have your garden in the wrong spot. Here, I got some flooding. <laughs> well, well, there's there's plants for those types of situations. <laughs> so there's a plant for every type of situation. <laughs> so uh, they just have to maybe move those a little closer and plant some plants that tolerate those conditions. So, well, the funny thing is they're in a pot, and I'm like, I don't know if the drainage holes are plugged or something. <laughs> oh, you mean your plants are flooded? The yeah, one some you of picked up yesterday? From well, I noticed it today. Oh, two that was Saturday you picked them up? Hmm. Yeah, my peppers. I put them in the, in the pot, and then I'll, I don't know what's wrong with that pot. <laughs> oh, you put them in your own pot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Well, you know, the pot shape makes a difference. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yes, if it's if it's slanted, it drains better. But if it's straight up and down, it tends to hold the water. And there's like a scientific theory on that. It's like if you take a sponge, and you a big sponge, and you fill that with water, then um, and then you hold it straight up, it really doesn't drip. But as soon as you turn it this way, it just pours out the bottom. I don't know what the science is behind that, but that's an actual theory. I mean, it's not theory; it's science. So uh, check your pot and. I don't know what's going on with it. <laughs> <laughs> Send me a picture of your pot. <laughs> or your, pl I'll say your planter instead. <laughs> I feel like I should like, now it's heavy, it's got stuff in it. I should lift it up and see what's happened. Uh, yeah. It should have draining, it has draining holes. Yeah, because peppers, will, peppers won't take wet. They like mm. it dry, so. Well, now, for now I shoved it under a table so it doesn't get any more rain. <laughs> We have a lot of succulents for sale and then I put them under the table so they wouldn't get as wet, but I didn't know we were going to have sideway rain and winds and so I'm going to have to dry those out. Not, not peppers, the uh, succulents, yeah. So everyone that's coming in, um, we'll be getting started in a few minutes. You have a Q&A on the bottom if you have some questions. Somebody's already got one down there. We'll take those at the end. And there's a chat function if you have like need to tell us something else. You won't be seeing yourself. You just see me and Kathy and Tom. I'm, I'm, you're all broken up. So I'm breaking up? Yeah, now I got you back. You're coming through like a Moog synthesizer. Oh. Dated oh. health. 
Kathy, you know what a Moog synthesizer is. Uh, I'm probably not familiar, not a very musical person. I love music, but I don't play one thing. Yeah, I have gamers in my house. Yes, I, somebody asked if they're muted. Ever, all the audience is muted, you won't be able to talk, <laughs> and you don't have video, so in this format. I will make one comment and I'll repeat this a couple of times as we go through. If you have any questions not related to the topic, send an email to Gardner SOS at outagamy.org. And then we'll get back to you when within a couple of days, hopefully with a correct answer. So we're at 60 right now, which there I guess maybe some people might be coming later, or I'm gonna sneak over into Zoom and accept more people if they wanted to come in. Um, you snooze, you lose. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my name is Jill. I'm with the Little Shoe Public Library, Kimberly Little Shoe Public Library. This is normally the day time that we do our Master Gardeners Presents with Tom. Um, we're doing it online now, and we're glad you all could join us. Uh, this month, we're going to talk about shade gardening with Kathy. Do I start? Yeah, you can start. <laughs> okay. I'll start with some credentials. Kathy is one of the founding members of this chapter of Master Gardeners. And that goes back to what, 98, I believe? Yeah, I, I took the classes in 99. So you're close. And um, she is undoubtedly the most knowledgeable gardener that we have in our organization. So That's very sweet, Tom. Yeah. And a lot of pressure, so. <laughs> She was very instrumental in getting me really involved in master gardening. Well, thank you. Mentored me quite a bit. And he's still here. He's still hanging on. Here. <laughs> still here. Well, tonight, uh, fellow gardeners, we're going to be talking about shade gardening. Um, it's something I'm passionate about. It's something, basically, it is probably my biggest focus in my yard since I inherited a house that had a lot of mature bass and maples. So let's get started and let's see what I can teach you about where to plant and what to plant. This is daffodils, pulmonaria, an old corn crib. Can you guys see my pointer? Yes. Good, awesome, that's even better. Pulmonaria here. And this is like a nice mixture of spring uh, ephemerals. Well, the, the, the um, um, the blue flower is, is, uh, is, will stay around with the leaves. So, all right, here we go. So we want to talk about what makes a successful garden in the first place. Because I think that's what people's biggest issue is, is they buy plants, they bring them home, they throw them in their garden, and they just haven't done any crap, they haven't done any homework. And it just leads to a lot of um, frustration and uh, failure. So um, I always start with successful planning steps. Um, Choose plants that are hardy in your area. Uh, choose plants with similar cultural needs. So what that means is you're not going to plant a, um, a uh, like a lavender next to a hosta because they have totally different needs and you're going to kill one or the other. So uh, choose plants that appeal to you, which for me is almost every plant. Um, consider height and color, exposure, sun or shade. What side of, uh, what is going to be the exposure, no, north, south, east, west, that's super important. Wind resistance, if you plant something super tall, in a very, I have a lot of places that I call wind tunnel, and um, if I put a tall plant there, it's going to be flat on the ground like after yesterday when we had really high winds. Uh, choose plants with disease resistance, coordinate a succession of bloom, add seasonal interest. Um, 
review reference materials. I can't tell you how important that is. Before you buy a plant, look and see what zone it's for. Does it like sun or shade? There's so much information on the web that, um, uh, that you can't hardly make a mistake if you do a little homework. Uh, you can draw a diagram. Sometimes that's very helpful, especially when you're creating a succession of bloom. So you'll be able to look up and see this plant blooms here, this plant blooms in July, this one plant, bl plant blooms in um, August. And then you can uh, have a lot of color throughout the year and then right plant, right place. So makes a big difference. Okay, right plant, right place. This is a hosta called Empress Wu, it's by my barn. This is my four-year-old grandson. Now, when I did the homework on this plant, it has giant blue leaves, so it's not gonna like a lot of sun because a real, it doesn't, this doesn't happen with every plant. There's a lot of plants that break the rules, but in general, the larger the leaf, the more shade that that plant needs because it's, if you have a large leaf and you give it too much sun, you're gonna have too much water trans, trans, uh, transpire and the leaves will start browning and, and um, it will not be an attractive plant. So doing my homework on this plant, I realized that potentially it could get three and a half, four feet tall, five feet wide, and it was gonna need just the right location. So I put it in an east, right next to the barn on the east side where it would get uh, morning sun only. So that's a really desirable uh, soft light in the morning. And it was right next to my water source. And I, you can see that that plant is dwarfing my grandson. So, okay, uh, planning site preparation. Uh, you have to remove, if you're gonna have a big planting, you wanna remove existing turf or unwanted veget vegetation. Now, that can be tricky. Uh, if you're planting right under a maple or a um, uh, like a oh like a pine tree of some sort uh, conifer, um, you probably won't have much turf. Uh, what you don't want to do is you either have to hand remove under established plants like those, or you know I'm going to have to say you might want to get out a little bit of Roundup. I know it's kind of a naughty thing right now, but if I do use Roundup, I just put a drop on a plant here and there. I don't use very much. It might take me 10 years to use four cups of Roundup. I just, just don't use it very often, but there are some spots that are worth it because you can't, you don't want to be digging underneath because we're talking about shade gardening. So we're basically going to be talking either about um, uh, you're having a lot of shade cast from a building or you're having a lot of shade cast from trees. So um, be careful when you're removing turf by just shoveling it out in big clumps because you might be damaging root systems on trees Then you'd have to go to sun gardening when your tree dies. So uh, avoid tilling under the drip line of established trees. Uh, avoid significant grade changes around established plants and trees. Consider raised beds for correcting poor drainage situations. And I'll discuss that around trees later. Um, you can have your soil tested. I generally find that that's a great idea, but normally your plants are pretty much gonna tell you if they don't like the pH of your soil. They're gonna show that on their leaves because they won't be able to take up nutrients if they're not comfortable with the pH. Uh, add add admin, admin, amendments um, to uh, the areas are for compacted soils, but I never mix anything into the soil when I add amendments. I only put it on top. So I think putting compost on top, leaf matter, uh, bark, anything like that is fine in a two to three inch layer, but don't mix it in because then you start a whole composting pro uh, process because composting is needs water, nitrogen, and uh, carbon. So all your amendments are carbon-based. So because they're leaves or they're bark, and if you start mixing that in, then you start the composting process. The soil is gonna to wanna to break that down. And when it starts breaking it down, it steals all the nitrogen out. So also mixing it in deeply around tree roots could damage the tree roots. So just lay it on top, it'll be fine. It's, the, your little critters in the soil are gonna make sure that uh, that is tilled for you into the soil. Uh, other considerations, if you have microclimates, um, you can be a little more daring with your zonal, your plant zones. Uh, 
your type of soil, you should kind of get an idea if you have sand, clay, or loam, which is, that's very sought after the loam thing. <laughs> so not a lot of people have great loam. Uh, the pH of the soil, like I said, will make a difference on how your plants grow, drainage of the soil, and now your type of light. Final tips for planting under trees. And now this I got from the uh, University of Minnesota. I just wanted to reveal that, that I kind of pillage some of their stuff. Um, so, uh, so final tips for planting under trees is avoid damaging tree roots. Do not add soil on top of tree roots. Compost, yes. Soil, no. Gently plant between roots. Do not cut into roots two inches or larger. Use a layer of mulch no deeper than two to four inches thick. Uh, look to nature for inspiration in plant selection. Um, be prepared to water the first year or two until plants are established. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what a lot of people think. This was the old theory of how trees grew. Uh, the, this shows an incorrect image of tree roots. It's a common misconception that tree roots mirror the branch structure. This is the more, this is actually the common way trees grow. Uh, this illustration is much more realistic. 90% um, of the tree roots are in the top three feet of soil and 50 to 75% of the feeder roots are in that top, top uh, foot of soil. So now you know why I say you shouldn't be damaging those tree roots, you won't end up having a tree. This is, I always use this as my example. This friend of mine had, uh, she bought a new house it was, uh, the house was put, was up, was set up higher in the grade where that tree was, uh, that maple tree. She bought this house because it had a huge, beautiful maple in the front and had a huge, beautiful maple in the back. And so she hired a company to build it up with stone to get the grade up higher. So, so when she walked out on her front door, it was a level grade and then it dipped down by the tree. And I said, well, that's great, but make sure you rope off that tree, all around that tree, as far as the drip line, and don't let that company drive over that root zone. And, um, well, she didn't. <laughs> so, so and then I said, this, so she calls me up in July, and she says, oh, my gosh, my tree is dying. I don't know. It, it's losing all its leaves. I said, yeah. I said, you let them, it compacted the soil when they ran it over multiple times with their machinery. I said, so whatever you do now, what you want to do is mulch it and water it, the soil's compacted. Well, I said that word compacted. I did say, whatever you do, don't till it. <laughs> so she tilled it. And um, this is what happened the next year when she had to have the tree chopped down <laughs> because she, she destroyed the tree by destroying that root system. She changed the grade, which the grade was already changed when the house was built, but it was, it, it seemed like it was coping with that. But once they drove over that root zone, it wasn't happy anymore. So the tree died and she had to take it down. She's done a lot, lovely job replanting. So because you can't add soil around the established trees, because you will suffocate that root zone uh, by covering it up. I know I see people circle their trees, then they fill it with soil. And what you are virtually doing is you are taking that, um, that layer, the outer bark layer, when you put that soil up against it, that rots that whole base of that tree where that where your um, where your bark is, and when that that's rotted, your tree is going to die because you are cutting off the feeding system of that tree, which is in the cambium later, which is right underneath the bark. So you can build up stones for a beautiful look, just have the look, but let let your plants. You can put the stones down, then let your plants fall over the wall like she's showing like this picture is showing, but don't raise that up with soil. So you can still have a beautiful look that way. Okay, so we'll have us have this, and it's, it's really hard to grow under a situation like this. I mean, there are plants that will do that, but the same plants that will fill in over here are also the same plants that you'll find 40 feet over in another part of your garden that you never planted. So, but there's a, there is a place for those. I mean, if, if you have a big situation like this and you have this kind of thing, you're not going to be able to grow just anything under there. Too deep a shade. Um, deep shade is considered two hours or less of sunlight per day. And uh, semi-shade is four hours of less per day. So when you're picking out plants, you want to keep that in mind. I would recommend 
Okay, here's another bad example. Some of us have these silver maples and they have, and even like box elders and other maples will do this too. And to a point, my ash tree has done this. They'll have all these roots on the top of the soil. And yeah, you can't grow grass. It's hard to mow over. It's just a nightmare to plant under. So my recommendation is mulching. I think that the mulch, you can see this just gives a beautiful line to the yard. Um, this kind of situation is mostly pines. If you wanted to trim them up so they look like Wisconsin palm trees, that would be up to you. That would give them more light. But I think this is a good way to address this. Then on these outer edges, where the drip line of the tree is kind of not there, I would then you could start planting some things on the outer edges. And then on uh, here's another one where you can see that it's challenged with just leaves. I, I leave my leaves alone because I think they feed the soil just like they would in the forest. But why not consider on those really difficult places where you have those tree roots is maybe putting in some kind of focal feature. I think that that would be a, a lot more attractive. Then you can start planting out beyond that to, uh, to just accent it, but make the stuff, give it a growable space. Or the other thing is nice is Lots of perennials, especially hostas, do really well in pots. Lots of annuals. You can actually take your wooded area or your woodland and and uh, would put your mulch on and put some pots around for uh, just for a nice visual look. A little wheelbarrow action. This is a, a pot that's filled with perennials that um, every year. This friend of mine, she just takes that pot and uh, she puts this in her unheated garage during the winter, or you can put it in an attached garage, lets it go dormant. Then she just puts it out in spring and fertilizes it and lets it go. So if you don't like to fuss with annuals, there's a lot of perennials that do well in pots over the winter. Okay, so if you do if your whole yard or you're, you, you, you feel so limited on what you can grow, um, just like nature trims its trees up. In fact, nature actually, when they get these lower limbs, they actually choke them off and, um, and, and it, they actually kill their own limbs, <laughs> the trees do. And that's why when you go in the woods, you see all these long stems. Those are really great to grow under because you have high filtered light and a lot of, a lot of uh, your, um, your shade perennials just love this situation. So, and uh, like if it was up to me, I would take this whole branch off right here and then this branch off right here. And then a lot of times you can get a tree trimmer, trimmer in who can lighten that canopy by just doing some select pruning. And then that just opens up a huge palette of plants that you can plant when you give that more, more air and more uh, sunlight filtering through. Under eaves is really, really difficult. People go, oh, what can I plant under there? Nothing without a drip irrigation system or continuous watering. <laughs> you know, unless we get a pelting rain that went sideways like yesterday, you, if you're going to plant under an eave, you are going to have to give that special attention. It's not magical. There's not any shade plants that will thrive on that. You maybe can put some irises in there, but if it's real shady, they're gonna have a very reduced bloom, but I do think they have fantastic foliage. So that might be something you could consider, but if you're gonna put it on a dry, uh, you know, underneath the eave, you're gonna deal with very dry soils. So look for the right plants for that. There are some. Okay, good plants for under trees. Okay, now I'm talking here, when I'm saying under trees, I'm telling you that these type of plants that I'm going to show you in the next few slides will almost grow in a closet. So when you have an area and you say, well, I really just didn't want to mulch it, I'd rather plant something. A juga, which is in the mint family and likes to really take off, this has got a beautiful spring flower, it's got lovely foliage, and uh, it's very low growing, so it's a low growing uh, ground cover, and this will do well under those conditions. Okay, this is a horrible plant, but I put it in here anyway. <laughs> Some people like it. It has a bit of a spotted leaf. It's called, uh, it's called uh, Virginia water leaf. That's like the nickname of it. It does have these nice little white flowers. And um, when I didn't know any better, like maybe 15 years ago, I accepted this and put it in my garden. It's everywhere but this will grow under the pine tree <laughs> a dense shade it will grow but it will also 
move through your garden. So I'm, I put it on there. I don't recommend it, but if you really are determined to have green instead of brown, brown um, mulch, then this would be, it would probably grow. This is a lovely plant, sweet woodruff. It has a really nice tender smell in the spring. It will creep along, but it's not a naughty plant. I don't see it going everywhere in my yard. Uh, so it's a well-behaved plant, and this would be also really well in patches under uh, deep shade. Pachysandra it will perform relatively well in deep shade. Uh, it does tend to run a little bit, but I think it's it's easy to pull out, and uh, this would be a recommended plant. Hostas, they will grow under trees, but they will not thrive under deep shaded trees. So um, uh, your your dark your your hostas that have more of the solid color with less white in the leaf will put up with a lot more shade than than hostas that are. Uh, have a lot of white or streaking or anything like that. So keep that in mind. I mean, there is, you could put hosta lancifolia under deep shade and it's probably going to just do fine because it's the oldest hosta besides uh, uh, undulata, aria marginata. It's a really old variety, really tough variety. Um, I'll let the rabbits go crazy on it and I don't have to worry about it because it's going to come right back. So, but the hostas are, do pretty well under trees. So um, probably, Maples are more challenging. So if you really want to put trees in your yard, my favorite recommendations are Kentucky coffee tree. Um, used to be ash, but now ash is plagued with uh, emerald ash borer, so I wouldn't plant an ash any longer. Uh, oak tree is a great tree to grow under. It provides really high, beautiful shade at some point. And um, also uh, a honey locust tree is a great yard tree. Um, both Kentucky coffee tree and honey locust have very tiny uh, leaves. So you really, I never have to rake under those trees. So that part's awesome. Uh, but they have nice, light, really filtered sunlight come through their foliage. They're not a heavy, like maple trees are just, their, their canopy is so dense. Okay, so here's another plant that spreads not rapidly, but rapidly enough to be tough. And this is a geranium, wild geranium. And the scent on this is amazing if you crush these leaves in your hand. I just love this. I will purposely, if it's moving out into the lawn, I love it when I mow over it because it smells heavenly. Okay, this is another plant that will, in the mint family, it's a lamium, it will totally go up, just totally be out of control. But it's so beautiful. And um, it's just, it will bloom almost all summer until you get into a dry heated spell. This will just be covered with these pink, purple, white blooms, uh, has a variegated foliage. There's some that have like a green stripe down the center or a green with a white stripe. And they, this is a really nice plant. It's a little bit naughty, but well worth growing. Okay, here's some natives that you might want to um, entertain. I certainly don't have a a lot of them and there are loads of them but it's an hour presentation so we had to pick and choose a little bit. Uh, Terriella is a really great plant for shade. Once established it can put up with quite dry shade. Um, this is Trillium. Uh, you can buy those legally and they make a beautiful ground cover but they are ephemeral so after they bloom they start kind of dying back. So they're nice to plant amongst other things. I love main hair fern. A lot of your ferns do really well under shady conditions, but this one especially is a woodland plant. Okay, here's a whole slew of na uh, non-native plants, and there are many, many more than this, but I had to kind of pick some of my favorites. So, of course, hosta is my favorite, or I wouldn't have uh, an embarrassing amount of them. So, um, they also, when you see this and you go, oh, you only have hosta, but I'll show you slides later, but you can get an awful lot of color uh, with just the foliage. And you can see how wooded this is, and these are doing really, really well. I love pulmonaria because rabbits hate pulmonaria. Deer hate pulmonaria. They do love hostas. That's the bad news. But this plant is bulletproof. It's got you can see that it comes in a lot of different 
color flavors to spotted leaves to all silver. There's all green ones. There's, there's dark, dark ones with big splotches. And they have a beautiful spring display like I showed you in the first slide with the daffodils. And they actually start uh, blooming kind of a blue color and then they fade to pink or they start pink and they fade to blue. But this is a really awesome plant. It is slightly naughty, but it mostly only spreads from the clump itself and not spreads all over your yard. This is another plant that the bunnies and the deer will leave alone. And this was uh, geranium Roxanne. And what's neat about it is that um, it is a geranium that if you put it with other plants, it will dance up between them and go above the, the foliage of the other plants and have really beautiful blue blooms, but very, very pretty plant. Okay, so this is the Roxanne geranium right here. So, and um, this is a ligularia called uh, Japonica. This is in Borner Botanical Gardens. And you can see over here that there is a Hakanakloa grass. So they have hookahs. This is their shade garden in uh, Burner Botanical Gardens. Really beautiful. Okay, and this is another one that is somewhat naughty. Uh, but you can see that the tougher plants that you can grow under shade tend to be like that. Um, this is uh, Bernera. Um, uh, and it's kind of got forget me not type flowers, little bitty blue flowers on it. The deer hate this and the rabbits hate this. So you get a beautiful plant with a lot of color for a shaded area and it won't be eaten down when you get up the next morning. This is Virginia. You don't see a lot of it. I ordered for the, uh, the Master Gardeners have a plant sale every year and I usually order a few plants and I don't know why they don't sell well because this is a fantastic plant. Really leathery leaves, lots of different types of colors and very pretty blossoms dance right above the foliage. Ferns, this is one of my favorites because it has such a light color and a dark shaded garden. Um, this will, it, it, I'm not, it needs water to perform well. So, and that's really another thing I should talk about because a lot of people think that fertilizer or the perfect soil or um, great mulching or great weeding makes a great garden. But that's not really the case. A great garden is from water. The best gardens I've ever seen, well, they usually have an automatic watering system. Um, but water makes a great garden. Plants getting the right amount of moisture really increases their size. It keeps the soil uh, damp and permeable by the root system so the roots can keep expanding. But this one doesn't need copious amounts of water, but it likes to be not dry, dry. This is something people don't see very often. I have this in my garden. This is naughty though. This will spread here and there. So, um, but it's still so unique. It's got a uh, really nice dark red stems, which is interesting. It's got kind of a columbine type foliage, but this can get three or four feet tall. So it's nice in, nice in the center of a border or as the backdrop to a border. And you don't see a lot of, uh, uh, tall, sturdy plants like this. Mine will fold over sometimes if it's just like almost hurricane gust winds and like tornado type winds. But otherwise, I cut it back and it starts sprouting back up. It's, it's very manageable. This is, people don't realize it, uh, I didn't put peonies besides this peony on my um, PowerPoint because I think peonies, yes, some will grow in the shade, they'll tolerate shade, but peonies do best in full sun. But this peony is a woodland peony. Um, you have to find it, you have to, you'd have to Google it and find it on, um, on, uh, on the internet. Uh, there's not a lot of places that sell it. It's expensive. It usually runs between 35 and $50. You might be able to find it a little bit cheaper, but it is absolutely stunning. And this will grow in quite a bit of shade, I'm sorry. Um, but this, has pretty spring display with, uh, yeah, and the dark, the foliage comes up darker like this, and then it has really pretty flowers. But this in the fall is when people come over to my garden, this is what they see, and it stops them dead in their tracks. They just absolutely love, this is the um, seed pod. And these things dry as hard as wood when they're done. 
So I use them in arrangements in the house and it's really a superior plant. So worth spending the money, it's a tough plant too. And then we have um, uh, Actea simplex, which uh, this used to be called Simicifuga, but then they decided for the nom nomenclature, they decided to rename it Actea. Um, and the reason is, is because it really looks a lot like baneberry, which is a woodland plant. So being in that family, it does really well in shady locations. Now, this is such a nice foil for light colored plants in your garden. And the thing about it is, is that um, the more, like if you give this, if you give this two hours of sunlight in the morning, it will be, it will grow, but it'll have more of a greenish cast. If you give it the four hours of sunlight, it's gonna have a darker foliage. Really, really beautiful bloom, so. And what I like about it is they also hold for the winter, so they give you some winter interest also. And those are nice for dried plants, for making dried arrangements also. Okay, so I can't even say enough good things about this plant. <laughs> this plant is amazing. We sell, I, I would have to say right now during our Master Gardener plant sales, this is probably the most popular plant I order. It, it wasn't like that. And they were actually literally 10 years ago, relatively unaffordable. But because of um, uh, tissue culture and they're starting to, people are realizing what a beneficial, awesome plant this is, that it's tough. It will grow in sun or shade. Uh, you know, the bigger, the more sun it gets, the bigger, the, the more flowers it's going to have. It will bloom for two and a half to three months. It's one of the very first things in your garden to bloom. Holds on and holds on the, those blooms forever. And it has beautiful foliage. Rabbits hate it. Deer hate it. It's just a phenomenal plant to grow. So if you see this some, somewhere or if you're at our plant sales next year, please, please pick one of those up, you won't be sorry. Okay, so I put this slide on because there's more Hackenachloa grass here, but this plant here is uh, Carex grayi. Now, it's a grass, and a lot of grasses, well, some Carexes will do well in the um, shade, but this one is interesting because it gets these really unique little spike, looks like kind of coronavirus <laughs> spikes on it. So um, it has uh, a neat, a neat flower head to it. Um, it. It will thrive in the shade. And I, I love, love this plant. The deer and the rabbits do not touch it. So obviously that's a win-win. This is Ligularia. Uh, Brit Marie Cropper is my favorite variety. Um, that's the one I usually order for the plant sale. Um, and these are, you have to keep these watered re relatively well for the first couple years. And because uh, they tend to flag, they have big leaves, but when you put them in a little more sun, the more sun they get, the darker the foliage will be. But they, um, I call my garden flag plant because when this plant flags, which I mean by flagging, going flopping on the ground, you need to water your whole garden. <laughs> That's why it's like an indicator plant for me. Now, when you water this, it's going to stand right back up the next morning. So uh, it's, it's really a great plant for that, but this is such a good foil. Like you can see here with coral bells, uh, the flowers of coral bells here, or if you put your grasses or hostas in front of there, it's just really a beautiful deep color. Here it is in bloom. So it's not only awesome, it's blooms. Um, and this one, you can see that this one probably isn't Brit Marie because it doesn't have quite, you can see this is a little more green. So if you get into, <laughs> if you go to a nursery, a hint is look at the backs of this and the darker the backs, the better, because that means the whole plant is gonna be more burgundy. So here you can see it right next to Hackna grass. And, and then you can see that they have hookeras back here. It's just a beautiful saying, this is Border Botanical Gardens again. Um, okay, so now here's a different Ligularia, and this one actually looks like a philodendron that you could grow in your house. This is an amazing plant. It's a giant, mine are at least four feet tall, has these big, beautiful blooms on them, but look at the cut leaf on that. It is just spectacular, and this is also a Ligularia. This is all green, but a funny thing happened in my garden, because I had this variety, and I had the Brit Marie, and now I didn't take a picture of it. I should have gone out and taken a picture of it, but 
of course, I was finishing this t yesterday and today, and so it was too rainy. <laughs> but I have one now that looks like this with the cut leaf, but is more burgundy. So they they had a baby, and it's it's amazing. So so I have a one of a kind. Uh, Medinia, I do order that sometimes. I don't have great success for it, but I've been into a master gardener's yard where that is three feet tall. So um, it's actually part of the rhubarb family, but it does have this crimson look in the spring and in the fall. Plus it has this beautiful flower. Now I'm a rough gardener. Anybody who comes over knows that you gotta look close sometimes to see the beauty in plants. Cause I got a lot of weeds with those. Um, but this one for a more attentive gardener is absolutely a beautiful selection and I've seen that down at the flower factory in a huge like six foot by eight foot stance and it just is stunning. Epimediums. I, this is another plant that for dry shade once established, it is, people, this is such an underestimated beauty. This plant is tough. It will grow under a maple tree once established. Um, it has beautiful, beautiful foliage uh, in the spring and in the fall. This is another color, but let me see if I have a foliage picture. There you go. This is in my yard, and this is how the foliage comes up in the spring, and it gets even redder in the fall. So this has got lots of seasons of interest, not to mention it has beautiful, dainty flowers. Really, I mean, they're nice to plant in like a ground cover, so you'd have, they don't really spread their clump for me, so you'd have to buy several, but um, it's well worth it putting, uh, making the investment for this. Um, I order those for the plant sale every year and I'm always stunned that we have some left because I'm like, why? So, okay, this is variegated Solomon seal. It can brighten up a darker spot. I have this growing in really deep shade. Uh, it does tend, if you give it great conditions, it can make a large, large patch like maybe 10 by 15 foot. <laughs> so, I mean, that's after five years with like two or three plants. So this one can spread under ideal conditions, but I give it less than ideal conditions. And that's how you can control naughty plants is, yeah, maybe it'll go crazy with, uh, with six hours of sun, but maybe under two hours of sun, you can still keep that beauty of that plant, but you can keep it under control. So this one's in one of the darkest parts of my garden and it just thrives. This is something that people rarely plant and you have to look for it a little bit in the trade. Uh, we do normally order that for the Master Gardener plant sale, but we didn't have a full plant sale this year. So, um, or any really. Um, so, I mean, to the public. So this one is well worth looking for. Uh, also in the rhubarb family, but has these beautiful, deeply veined cut leaves and it flowers really pretty, either pink or white. Uh, they, this is a color that's called bronze, but it, they are bronze when they come out of the ground in the spring and then they get like a deep, deep green. Um, and then they bronze up again in the fall. So another uh, season, I've never had the deer touch this or the rabbits, not even once. I put dailies, dailies in here because people love them. I think they do best in sun. The more sun you give them, the better. Will they thrive in part shade? They will, but they won't flower as much. Uh, they tend to be a little floppier, but they are still worth putting in, not in the deepest, darkest spot of your garden, not under a pine tree, certainly, but I, in something that the, sometimes the best shade is shade that's just on the edge of your tree line. Those They do very well there. So many different colors. There's like, I thought the hosta groups were crazy, but the daylily groups are just as crazy. There are some clematis that will do well in the shade, and this is one of them called Raguchi. Um, I know that so, uh, Song Sparrow Farm carries them. Um, there's a few places you could Google that, and you'll find a place. This thing blooms from June until frost. Uh, every year has these beautiful little bell-shaped flowers and it will tolerate quite a bit of shade. Oh, I must have them in there twice. Ah, okay. And so now um, this is the next segment is on hookera and hookerellas. So this is where all of our 
our uh, hookerellas and hookerellas come from is this native hookera, which where you see is growing is like on top of an inch of dirt on slabs of rock. And that's why a lot of people don't have great success for with them in this area because they are more, they like their their roots to be well drained. But if you can find the right situation, they will tolerate quite a bit of shade. Uh, this is growing in a woodlands right here, and this is out east. So, um, but there's so many beautiful colors. Look at them all. I mean, these are so tempting not to buy every single shade and try them. But I uh, just watch your location. A raised bed is best for these. Um, I've seen people that just can grow the largest clumps of these, but it's always in more of a raised bed where they get really great drainage. Because in the winter, they won't tolerate, you know, a, really a lot, of, a lot of spring water. This is hookerella. This was like the newest variety uh, because it's a trailing hookerella. Hookera. And the cool thing about this is my friend put this in her yard in a pot and it trailed over the pot. And the next spring she had tons of baby hookerellas just had hit the dirt and, and rooted right there. And she had them all over the place. And they, they don't spread, but they spread if they touch the ground. But these um, are just, these colors stay all season long. So your palette in a shade garden is just can be amazing. So this is a couple different varieties. I think I have that in twice also. Okay, and then a steel bee. A steel bee likes a little bit of more damper soil, um, a, a little more moisture. It'll tolerate less moisture after two or three years of establishment. Uh, it'll grow in deeper shade. It likes a little, if you get, the more light that you give it, the more it's going to bloom. But you can see that this is a shade garden and look at the color in here. Because I think a lot of people go, oh, what can I grow in the shade? So many things. And this is my favorite bulb, just old daffodils. I like tulips too, but where I live, the deer like tulips and the rabbits love tulips. And so I grow just daffodils. Uh, the they, Rabbits and deer won't touch these. They're a great color, you know, just a great color for spring. Um, another thing you could do too is if you have like let's say four or about four hours of, of uh, light in your garden is you can interplant these with daylilies. That's what the, this is Larry Conrad's yard and he's in El Dorado. He has one of the best private botanical gardens I've ever been at. He usually runs tours every year. I don't know if he will this year because of COVID but COVID's kind of changed everything. But you can see how he's got daylilies coming up in here. And another thing to plant amongst your, because everybody complains, oh yeah, the daffodils are nice, but when their foliage uh, starts dying, they look hideous. But if you plant daylilies amongst them, the, their daffodil foliage will completely be hidden. And another thing that'd be really pretty in here too is alliums. So then you'd get daffodils, alliums, and then you'd have your daylilies covering up the big mess. Okay, shade tolerant shrubs. Now there's a lot of shrubs. I just picked out a few that I have actually grown and have not killed. So, azalea. So um, now azaleas and some of your uh, hydrangeas that I'll show you do need a more acidic soil to really perform well. Um, and so I do give them a, a uh, acidic treatment. Just there's, a, it must be like, a miracle grow for acid-loving plants. That's a great thing to put around in spring. Don't overdo it, just do what the directions say. More is not always better. So the difference between azalea and rhododendron is that the rhododendrons hold their leaves during the winter, and azaleas are deciduous and drop all their leaves. And basically they're the same family besides those two things. So if you like some evergreen, in the winter, then you'll want to grow rhododendrons. I don't know how many are hardy here. You would have to look at a catalog that's sold basically to northern gardens. Um, I do know that uh, PJM is one of the hardier ones, and uh, mine wintered over in a pot in the garage. So, uh, but I'm going to put it in this year. I, I promised the plant I would put it in this year. Dogwoods can be very, very beautiful in the garden. Uh, this is a variegated dogwood. It has a, you can see how light it is next to the pine tree there. Mock orange. I have a mock orange right by my barn where it's quite shady there. And uh, it, the smell is 
overwhelming. It's so awesome. And it blooms right after lilacs. So when the lilac smell is going away, you get your mock orange smell, which is overpowering. And uh, this is my husband. This is my Empress Wu Hosta, but that's my mock orange. It's just, a, I bought that. It was like one twig at a early plant sale 20 years ago. And it's been sitting in that one spot forever and ever. And it, it, that's as tall as it gets, is about as tall as my husband. So it doesn't get totally out of control, but the smell is amazing. And this hum, summer hydrangea, I can't, I don't grow them well at my place because I'm in a very windswept open area and it doesn't like the winter at my house. But my daughter grows this and it literally looks like this. And she has it in a, in uh, what I considered a protected site, like I talked about in the very beginning, uh, a microclimate, and it blooms this profusely. It's just absolutely stunning. Otherwise, if you're not gonna give it a protected area, I would say skip that and go to Hydrangea Invincible Spirit. This is a new, um, all right, let me go back once. Let's see. Okay, this is a microphylla. This was something we were so jealous with for for because all southern gardens had the microphylla that they could get these deep beautiful blue colors and this one will be pinkish unless you give it the acid treatment uh, because it likes an acidic soil so in order to develop that color it needs to pick more aluminum out of the soil um we have aluminum in our soil it's just because of our acidity which is about a seven or a 7.2 the plant doesn't have the ability to access that aluminum to give it that beautiful blue color. So that's why I said you might want to check pH before you put in some acid loving plants so you'll know how to adjust it. So, but she does really well with that. I don't, but if I ever find a protected place around my house, I'm going to plant one because I think they're stunning. Now this is an aborescence. Now aborescences are general snowball hydrangeas. You see them all over with the big white floppy heads. Um, I've had relatively good luck with this. Um, it, the more sun it gets, the less floppy it will be, but it's still really a really beautiful color in my garden because I can put it amongst my hostas and it'll kind of poke up and be have that pink flower for a very, very long time. And this being an aborescence, which is our standard hydrangea that we grow here like crazy, um, it's very hardy. Um, now, the other hydrangea I didn't put on here is a PG hydrangea, and there's a lot of great new cultivars out there that have the big uh, pentacle type blooms that are like cone shaped, but those like a lot of sun. I have one in partial shade, and I get pretty good bloom on it, but it would be much better in sun. So the uh, paniculatus don't like, uh, don't like shady conditions as much as the uh, aborescence and the endless summer. Okay, and then I just put this in because it also gives you good winter interest. And gosh knows we need some winter interest. Okay, I put in tree peonies. I would not put a tree peony in deep shade. I would put it in the edge of your shade zone. So um, they'll have more flowers on them if you give them a little more sunlight, but they're very, very tolerant of uh, like four hours of sunlight a day, filtered sunlight, anything like that. There are actual meters out there will tell you how much sunlight a certain area gets. I've seen them for sale. So um, this is a boxwood. There's only two boxwood. I think there's actually one that grows that uh, I, uh, I can't remember the name of the nursery now, but it's up in Green Bay and he's hybridized his own that's just very hardy. But I've had great luck with this green mountain boxwood and green velvet boxwood. Literally, I have the worst yard to grow stuff in because of the whipping winds all winter long. And they don't miss a beat. Mine are thick and full and actually need to be trimmed severely. So uh, a great plant for um, uh, if you want an evergreen look all year round. I could have put you on here too. Yous are also very shade tolerant. But if I was going to pick between the U and the boxwood, I would pick the boxwood every time. So, viburnums, there's lots of great viburnums. They have uh, really beautiful leaves, gorgeous fall color, red berries. So, it looks like you've hung ornaments on this shrub. Very shade tolerant. Um, some of them have extreme, like Judy Eye has extreme fragrance. Um, they also have white flowers. So, 
this is a winner winner chicken dinner <laughs> so it's awesome for the shade and there are dwarf varieties with this too they, they can go anywhere from four feet tall to eight feet tall under story trees so you bought a lot and it has a lot of mature trees on but you want to have that well you're not getting any color out of it um yeah you have they're real tall and they're uh the branches are up high so if you look at a natural woods they have a lot of understory trees so um Autumn brilliant service berry is one of my favorites because it has great fall color it has it has beautiful blooms and it has blueberries on it which you'll never get one off of that tree because the birds are going to eat them all first. So if you're kind of a birder and you like to like to feed the birds, this is a great tree for that. And this will take quite a bit of shade. Great understory tree, beautiful color. Uh, I put red bud in here. Some people have great luck with them. There is a northern Minnesota variety. It's the only one I would recommend buying because these are stinkers. You'll put them in and they'll be good for about 10 or 15 years. And then all of a sudden, you know, spring will come that 15th year and it'll be totally dead um so i avoid them in my windswept property but if you know if you really truly put it in an understory location in like a wooded site i think it would do very well i know master gardeners that have them and they just are stunning and they probably have the more northern variety um one you don't want to buy is forest pansy it's stunning. It has dark purple foliage, but it will die on you after you just start to really love it. So that is for southern areas and not ours. So this does have beautiful heart-shaped leaves. It's really a great tree, and I would just try to find the northern variety, though. Magnolia trees. There's so many different kinds, but um, they're not, they're hardy, and they'll leaf out but they're so fussy about frost. So I have this particular one and it went through that frost. It was blooming, it looks fantastic. It didn't drop its petals or anything because we just had what, five days of frost. It was a nightmare um, for, cause I was out covering up like 340 or 300 or 400 hostas. I was trying to anyway, um, but this one did really well. So these are great understory trees. They will take quite a bit of shade. They like that protection of shade. And then I have another one that is like a bigger rose color bloom. And that one is very frost. It's not frost tolerant. This one sees me. So just kind of, I would, I would get a magnolia, but I would ask around Larry Conrad. Um, he has a, uh, website of uh, Conrad Art Glass, and uh, he's on Facebook all the time. He's a magnolia expert. He'd be able to guide you on what variety to, he, will, he doesn't mind being challenged, but these are expensive trees, and I guess I would want to know what would be the better one to put in my yard. Beautiful, though. Uh, Katsura trees are way underplanted, stunning, stunning trees. I have a weeping Katsura, and the spring color is gorgeous. The fall color is even prettier. This is the fall color here. Tiny leaves, so they don't really, you just mow them up. You don't have to rake them. A uh, lot, of, lot of interest. Uh, they come in single stem. They come in uh, multi-stem. Really pretty. Totally underplanted. Um, Japanese maple, I would, there's only a couple varieties I would recommend. Uh, one might be Crimson King, and one might be something, there's a new variety out there that's more, cold tolerant, but a lot of people can grow them in very protected areas. This is like a full moon variety. Uh, this is in one of our master gardeners uh, yards named P Peter Cordes. And he had, this is a shade garden. They like shade. They do great as understory trees, but he has it in a very protected location right next to his house. Otherwise, I would not put this in the middle of nowhere. I don't think it would winter over well, but stunning, still worth trying it. Okay, so the first thing I do when I'm planting a garden is I combine my plants to provide a lot of texture because that is really, it just is much prettier than having just mass plantings of everything in the same size leaf. You can see that we've got, you know, medium, fine textured, large textured, whole different thing going on with these lobe leaves here with your uh, blood root. This is a, that's a, just a really quick snapshot of good texture. Here's a friend of mine, Audrey Temmer's garden. Um, she, this is, believe it or not, just morning sun. This is in the shade in the afternoon. And she grows a huge variety of plants. There's a bleeding heart back here, which I could have put on, but that can kind of seed all over the place. I was a little fussy about that. 
Um, this is, um, she gave me a piece of this and I was, Larry, cause this, well, what is the name of this plant? It's just, uh, um, I mean, I know it and I just can't think of it right now, but this, this will, if you don't get the gold variety, the green variety will spread all over your yard. Uh, and she's got, you can see she's got a lot of texture change here. Very pretty. Or you can, when you find an impossible situation, sometimes you can get a nice, like here's a pine tree. This person put all annuals around that pine tree. And if you keep them watered, which your pine tree is going to like anyway, they'll probably do pretty well. And this is a, just a shot of somebody mixing up annuals. I see impatience, lots of impatience with their other shade plants here. This is pretty shady and it's got a lot of nice hostas and this gives it a pop of color. This is also Larry Conyard's yard. This is in shade, not deep, but probably four hours of sunlight a day. He's got Lilium here. He's got some kind of weeping larch here, I think. Uh, he's got day lilies. And he's got understory trees all over this property. A lot of different types. He'll grow things that other people won't even try. Um, just a beautiful garden if you ever get a chance. He's even got clematis. I would say that's Giacomani. So very pretty. This is a shot in my yard when it looked that good. I'm going to clean it up this year. I'm, I'm working on it. Um, but you can see that there's a lot of texture here. I've got the uh, pine back here with the blue in it. And then I did plant a tricolor beech here, which is now probably about 20 feet tall. And uh, this hostas, this was only morning sun. In the afternoon, it gets very deep shade. This is another texture shot from a place by my uh, old farmhouse. Very, very, very deep shade under a cedar tree. And I don't know where this is, but I thought it was really beautiful. There is a azalea there. Uh, so you can see that you could look ferns here. Looks like daylilies. I don't know what that is, but still awesome. Hostas, a lot of good texture there. And this is it. There are no gardening mistakes, only experiments. And I've been experimenting for a long time. And that's why I can talk on some of this stuff because I've killed a lot of stuff. So now I'm just a lot pickier and I try to really, before I waste a lot of money, I do try to uh, do some more homework or look it up. There's no excuse anymore for not being able to look up anything and everything with uh, the internet. So, so at this time we can probably entertain uh, some questions. Jill's going to shoot me some questions. Okay. So we had a couple questions in the Q and A and if you still have some, you can put some in. Um, can you address some tips for rabbits? They're out of control this year. They are out of control. Um, I have really good luck with Deer Off or any of those deer type deterrent products that are spray on. Um, you can mix a homemade variety, I heard. I haven't done it. I'm number one, too lazy to do it. And number two, you do have to run them through a strainer. So then we get back to my too lazy to do it. <laughs> so, so I buy... Um, Anything that says it repels rabbits and deer, um, just the liquid form, I mix it together. Unfortunately, I have to go out after every rain, heavy rain, and respray. It does work if you're diligent about it. Um, I'm trying a couple new products this year that I'll be able to report on next year. Um, one was called Defeat and one called Plant, plant Skid. Now, the Plant Skid was pelleted, um, and some people, I did mix some mothballs in there, so a little bitty miniature ones. Um, I haven't seen a problem since I did that, but now we're talking after severe rain. I mean, super severe. So I'm probably going to go out and retreat again tomorrow uh, when the rain stops, but that's the only thing besides fencing. One thing about rabbits, deer impossible. I mean, deer just, I don't care what you put up for deer. There's nothing that keeps a deer, a motivated deer out of your yard, unless it's an eight foot fence. But for rabbits, you know, everybody, you can put the rabbit fence up and they're about two feet tall, but then you say, oh, geez, I have this hideous rabbit fence around my garden. But if you were to put that rabbit fence back two feet in your garden and then put a rabbit uh, put a plant in front of there that the rabbits won't touch then you can hide the fence with the rat plant the rabbits won't touch and then you know it would keep the rabbits out of the part of your garden that they're attracted to um 
that's what I would do, would recommend is that option. And, you know, they don't like cat mint, which is beautiful in front of a fence. Uh, they don't like pulmonaria. Uh, I just gave you a whole slew of ideas of what plants they don't like. So, and then if you put that fence right behind those plants, it'll detract from the unattractiveness of the fence. That's my best advice for that. And maybe eating them, but only in the R months. <laughs> so. Um, so somebody had asked by email, can the perennial passion plant be grown on the north side of a house and should it get covered in winter? Perennial, is that the vine? I, passion plant. Yeah, there is a passion vine. Um, I've seen it grow against a brick wall and live, but I don't think they're super, super hardy. So I would say that would have to be put in the right plant, in the right place. And would you have to cover it? I don't know how much that helps, so. She also asked about perennial hibiscus, if that can get grown on the north side of the house. I would say that it would need at least four hours of sunlight uh, to do well. I've had hibiscus in my garden in the shade and it doesn't do, it gives me two blooms a year. It's spindly, but I've seen it in other properties where it's on uh, the east side of the house. Um, it can take full sun or the east side or the west side, but I wouldn't put it directly on a north side. I don't think, I think it'd be very disappointed in the growth of it because I have mine in my shade gardens and it doesn't do much. And finally, I had for three years and it was like two stalks and three, three blooms. And I've gone to people's houses where you can't even walk past their trail on there. It's so, it's <laughs> like five feet wide. So I would say it needs more sun. Okay, what deciduous shrubs will grow in shade with a height between three and five feet? There's a lot of them that will, depends on what the shade is. I mean, they're not going to grow in deep shade, but a lot of like your spireas, your wigilias, uh, the shrubs I mentioned on the PowerPoint here, um, those will grow in shade. Um, just remember that they're not going to bloom as much and they're not going to be really thick and hardy. They're going to need sprayrias and wygelias thrive in a little more sunlight, but you can put them in, I wouldn't put them on the north side of a house, but you can put them on the east, west, and south side. But your hydrangeas, they'll grow in a lot more shade. Okay, uh, let's see. We got that one. There's a lot of questions about whether this will be accessible afterwards. This presentation will be accessible afterwards. I believe your key will still work to go to the recording of it, or you can find it. It'll be on hopefully the OCMGA website. It'll be on the library website. Um, can you mention any other shade plants that will do well in sun? Huh. Well, I would say that um, I do have a lot of hostas that are in the sun. So, I mean, they get more sunlight than shade. And certain varieties, especially the thick-leafed varieties, will do better. Um, most of your plants, even the ones I mentioned, will tolerate sun really well. I mean, I'm the whole idea of this presentation was to tell you what you what will maybe make it in the shade. <laughs> Almost everything will make it in the sun. But <laughs> just remember that the larger the leaf of the plant the less tolerant they will be of sun. Now that's, that's like, if you, if you notice, um, lavender, um, Russian sage, those have really fine, tiny leaves. They need a lot of sun so they can photosynthesize. So, but when you get a hosta with a giant leaf or, or even though some of the ligularias, they have such big leaves, those are gonna transpire too much water in the sunlight. So remember the smaller the leaf, like your, anything in your Coreopsis or any of those plants that are just standard, standard perennials that have medium size to small leaves are gonna do great in the sun. So when you're looking at a plant, first of all, turn the tag over and see if it says sun or shade. That's a really good idea. But they will, things prefer more sunlight than less sunlight. They actually really do. They grow better with more sunlight. I'm just giving an idea of what you, your possibilities of with more shade. So. Okay, I'm considering a dogwood shrub, but I've heard about mildew problems and they prefer moist areas. What are your thoughts? That's actually true. They actually grow on the sides of swamps. Um, your red twig dogwood, your yellow dogwood. 
um, but they will, they're super tolerant of almost any type of garden soils. So if that's one of those things where, where we said before, where somebody's backyard still had two inches of water in it um, after this rainstorm, super tolerant of that. I've had other shrubs where one year we got seven inches of rain in a week and I had elderberry dye um, because it was sitting in water for like three or four days that didn't drain down and that killed the plant. Remember when that water sits on top of that plant, if the root system isn't, isn't capable of taking up oxygen because it's being smothered by water, it will, it's going to suffocate itself and die. So, but some plants, root systems are tolerant of that and they'll work around those conditions and dogwood is one of them. And there's a lot of really great dogwoods out there that have lots of different color barks. So you could um, uh, Google that and see which ones you'd be attracted to. I like the variegated leaf ones myself because they also have very pretty attractive flowers in the spring. They have that really beautiful coral bark in the winter. So they have a lot of interest. I think dogwoods are a great shrub. Now they will, I mean, they spread all over my farm because I have a, I live in a swamp, but um, I think your cultivated varieties would be, have a difficult time spreading, so. Okay, we have any edibles that will grow in the shade? Believe it or not, you can harvest tasta pips and eat those if you want to. <laughs> so, um, edibles, hmm. There's, you'd have to Google that. I'm, I don't really eat those plants. I usually eat lettuce and, well, all right. If you want a shade plant that you can eat, but it's not a, it is a perennial, is you can eat stinging nettle. <laughs> so that's a weed in the garden, but honestly, you can pick that. My daughter comes over and gets bags of it every week and she takes it home and steams it and puts it in eggs or anything like that. It's highly nutritious. Now, that's a weed that grows in your garden. Um, I would have to, I'd have to re go back and look at my PowerPoint. I'd say you have to really, you'd have to Google that. I'm not really sure what, I don't eat them. So I, I don't want to <laughs> challenge them in that way. I want the plant to be the whole plant. Uh, but there are a lot of edible things that do grow in the shade. Hmm. We have another pest problem. Um, does D, deer off work at keeping groundhogs from digging up plants in the shade garden? Any recommendations for keeping them away? No, <laughs> not any. I have groundhogs too, and they like to dig big holes under my plants. Um, the best thing you can do for keeping groundhogs away is a very aggressive terrier. <laughs> I've had my dog, my dog has actually picked up like a 20 pound groundhog and shaken it to death. So uh, once he's not in his prime anymore, but when he was in his prime, honestly, he would go and just, he would just decimate any groundhog he saw. And then my, the groundhog problem went away. Totally. They left. Wow. But now, wow. That he, now that he's older and blind, it's not working out so good. <laughs> so they're coming back. But no, I don't know of any way uh, besides trapping them and um, disposing them that way. There, there's, deer off's not going to do it for groundhogs. Okay. We have, what temperature is safe to start leaving annuals out overnight? Um, I would say that you could do anything from 40 and above. So, I mean, technically freezing is freezing and you probably should be able to leave them out a little bit lower. They're not going to really grow much at 40, but they're not going to die either. So they like warmth. What is your absolute favorite hosta for the north side and deep shade of a very wooded lot? <laughs> Um, I would say Crossa Regal would be a good one for that. It's called K-R-O-S-S-A Regal. Um, or, or Regal Splendor would be great. Um, any of your big giant blue ones will do well because they have, just say the bigger the leaf and the darker the leaf, the better it's going to do in the shade. And there's a lot of them, like 10,000 I think there's at least eight, there's 10,000 known cultivars that are available somewhere, maybe. And uh, there's, a, there's a great um, free internet site called hostalibrary.org. And that has 8,500 different hostas on there. So it, that's a good place to investigate what you might be interested in. How often should you divide your hostas for a healthy plant? Never. 
They'll never need to be divided ever, ever. A lot of times they will get what they call a fairy ring where just the outer edge, the middle dies out because the host is always, it's always sending out new buds from the crown. Well, so here's the crown. Whoops. <laughs> here's the crown and it's going to go out like that. And that's why it creates a fairy ring in the middle. Now I know people that dig that center out and put compost in there. Well, I don't know. The plants still want to, to want to go this way. I when I I have a lot of them with giant fairy ring, and just the outer edges are filled in with buds. And when that thing fills out with leaves, you cannot tell the difference. I never touch them. I never divide them. The only time I will do that is if someone begs me hard enough to dig one up and give them a piece. But as far as I'm concerned, I've never divided a hosta ever, unless I'm begged to. So you don't ever have there's. That's why they're a popular plant. Unlike daylilies, which have to be divided in order to keep the blooms coming, uh, they'll get very intense, a very intense ball of uh, like these little tubers in the, underneath the daylily and they start crowding each other out and then they don't send up a lot of blooms. So they have to be divided. Hostas, that's why people love them. You put them in, they're good for the rest of your life. Unless you kill them, which I do sometimes. Do you know the light requirements for fuchsias? I've heard they don't like afternoon sun. I think most things that like shade like morning sun because morning sun is cooler. It's not as intense. You don't have the heat of the day plus the, the really strong sunlight on top of that. So I would have to agree. Um, I have grown fuchsias before, fuchsias, but I, but I don't really do a lot of annuals because I don't like to drag a hose around in water because my property's bigger. So, uh, but I would say that, yes, they would probably like filtered sunlight or morning sun. Okay, I had Salomon's seal under a plum tree and it did very well. Last summer, the high winds took down the tree, so now it is in full sun. Doesn't matter, it'll still come back beautifully. It's gonna grow like crazy. Okay. See if we have anything. Those are all our questions in the Q and A. In my, well, I don't, this doesn't have much to do with shade, but someone has in my vegetable garden turkey like to dust themselves. Any suggestions? <laughs> fence, a fence, a fence. <laughs> uh, you'd have to net it, or I like for here. I can't grow vegetables unless I net them. I mean, I actually am going to. I bought these. Um, these fibrous bags, they're thicker than the black, the black cloth that you put down for, for weed barriers and they're round and I bought those this year so I can put a, uh, a, a, um, a netting over the top of them. Otherwise I won't have any vegetables. So now I've raised the vegetables up. So it's gonna be 12 inches tall, that keeps the rabbits out. And then I'm gonna net them from the deer. And so, you know, they're, the critters are out there. They're going to attack your stuff. They want to eat it as much as you do. Or, and so there's just, the only thing you can do is put up physical barriers. Because you don't want to spray your vegetables with deer off because they'll taste like hot pepper, rotten egg doo-doo or something. It's not going to taste good. So you're going to have to put up physical barriers. All right. Well, that's all our questions. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you're welcome. If you have more questions, Tom, did you want to give that email again for SOS? Yes, it is GardnerSOS at outagamey.org. Uh, if you have any more questions about shade gardening, send them there and I'll uh, connect it up with Kathy and we'll get them answered for you. That'd be great. I'd be glad to do that. Right. And it's, like I said, this recording will be available either with your key or on the OCMGA website or our Facebook page at the Kimberly Wilshire Library. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yep, thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, I'm going to end it.